Welcome back to another episode of As I See It. I know it has been a while and I apologize for that. I've been kind of taking a little bit of a break from politics, to be honest with you. And many of you who follow me on the other channel know that I haven't, I, I had been ill and all kinds of things. If you're new here, this is the channel where I talk about politics, current events, social issues through the lens of history. And if you happen to land here because you saw my face, just to let you know, this is the channel where I talk about politics. So if you don't want to hear politics, go back to the other channel where I don't talk about them quite as much. But this is definitely where I talk about uh, my thoughts and philosophies and things on politics. Today I want to talk about Liz Cheney. If you're following the news at all, you know that Liz Cheney is in the news. And maybe even by the time you see this, maybe even now, I haven't checked the news, she might already be have lost her position of power in the Republican Party. So in case you don't know, the Republican leaders are working right now to remove Wyoming Representative Liz Cheney as the third ranking representative in the House. So... Under, according to the House Minority Leader, Kevin McCarthy, the other day, he said they're removing her because she is not representative of the policy messaging they want in the Republican Party. Okay, so Kevin McCarthy's excuse for removing Liz Cheney from power in the political in the Republican Party is that she's not really representing the policy of the party. So hold on to that thought. So, in case you haven't been following, what is up? What, what's Liz Cheney doing that's upsetting everybody so much? She's telling everybody that the election was not stolen. She's telling everybody the truth. She is telling anybody who will listen that this big lie that's being propagated by the Republicans and the former president is a lie. That every state has certified their votes that every state that was challenged by the former guy was proven again and again and again through numerous recounts. I mean, we there were so many recounts, and there was never any proof of the widespread voter fraud that they are still claiming. That is her crime. Her crime, according to the Republicans, is speaking the truth to their lie. That's it. Telling the truth. She is getting censured. She is getting removed from her leadership position within the party for telling the truth. And, of course, they're not going to say that, though. Oh, we, no, we're removing her because she's telling the truth. They can't say that, right? So they have to find an, another reason. And the minority leader, Kevin McCarthy, is saying it's because she's not the best policy message for the party. So what's interesting about this is her replacement is going to be Elise Stefanik from Pennsylvania. Elise Stefanik rose in party favor in her support for Trump during both of the impeachments. She spoke out in favor of Trump. She spoke out against impeachment. She voted against impeach impeachment. Sorry, you can hear Sadie <laughs> drinking her water. I live in an RV with a dog. What are you going to do? So, yeah, she's risen in favor. Uh, the former president has speak, spoken out in her favor many times, lavishing her with praise for carrying on his big lie and carrying on in support of him even when he should have been impeached twice. So she is the person who is going to replace Liz Cheney as third-ranking party leader in the House Republicans. So don't you find that fascinating? That the one person in the in one of the few people in the Republican Party who are willing to speak up, stand up for truth, stand up for democracy, is getting ousted in favor of implementing a loyalist. There's no other way to put it. She's a loyalist. She is a former person loyalist. I think I just said his name a few minutes ago. I try not to say his name. In a CNN report that I read this morning, they're saying what we already know, that this isn't about policy. This is about installing a loyalist. It's just mind-boggling. I, I, it's mind-boggling. We're going to get to that in a minute because we're going to talk about historical context and why this matters. Why this really, really matters. But interestingly enough, 
So McCarthy says that they're ousting Cheney. The excuse that they're using is that she's not towing the party line as far as policy. When the fact is, the person who's going to replace her has a record of not supporting the former president as much as Liz Cheney has. So according to this CNN report, Liz Cheney voted in favor of the former president's policies 93% of the time. In 93% of the votes or the bills or whatever that were forwarded by the former president, Liz Cheney voted in favor 93%. While Stefanik, the person who's going to replace her because supposedly she's more in agreement with the Republican policies, voted with former president just 78% of the time. Mm -hmm. You heard me right. Liz Cheney voted with the president 93% of the time. The person who's going to replace her when they yank away all of her power only voted with the president, the former president, 78% of the time. So we all knew it's bull. We all knew that they're not really getting rid of Cheney because of policy or because she's not towing, you know, she's not, it's not about policy at all. It's about the fact that she's speaking the truth against the big lie propagated by the former person. That's it. This is what the Republican Party has become. It's not about ideals. It's not about ideas. It's not about morals. It's not about doing what's right for the people considering every single Republican voted against the stimulus checks, the, the, the pandemic stimulus package, every single one of them voted against it. And now they're coming out and uh, promoting it like it was their idea. So this is not a party about people. It's not a party about family values because they're propagating a lie. Since when is lying a family value? So Liz Cheney is being removed from leadership. They can't remove her because she was voted in, but they can remove her from her leadership position. They can censure her for one simple reason, for telling the truth. If this doesn't terrify, it terrifies every thinking person out there. Anybody with half a brain sees what's going on, sees the writing on the wall, and sees what the Republican Party is really about. I just saw a poll recently, though, that, uh, you know, yes, Biden's approval rating is very high. It's about 15, 53% nationwide, whereas the former president's was 43% at this point in his presidency, but it's still one of the lowest approval ratings in the first hundred days since Eisenhower. So while Biden is more popular than the former person by 10 points, he's still lower in popularity despite all of the amazing things I think he's been doing since he took office. His approval rating is still lowest since Eisenhower. Why? Because we're divided. And that's dangerous. Not only are we divided, but we have one major party who is willing to just get rid of any truth tellers. So I want to talk about history. I want to talk about why this matters, why this should, should, should scare every American. <laughs> I, I, we know, but so there's several examples in history that I could draw on about why, about the dangers of removing truth tellers and removing people who don't agree instead of incorporating them into the party and having, I know from my own professional experience, you know, that it, it's not a good thing to be surrounded by people who agree with you all the time, right? It's not a good idea. You don't grow. You don't learn. Uh, especially as a marketer, you know, team efforts really create the best work. And surrounding yourself with yes men is not how we evolve. It's not how we grow. And I'm going to talk about in history, the different times in history that truth tellers or dissenters have been purged and what the ramifications of that have been. Because I've, I had a, an, a, a discussion with a young man, very young, in his early 20s on Facebook the other day. He's a friend of a friend on Facebook. And he was defending former president. And he kept saying, you know, I haven't been on this planet very long. And I, I asked him, I said, well, how much history have you studied? And he's like, I don't need to study history. 
I don't need to know. I know everything I need to know. History matters. And the reason knowing history matters is that so that you can recognize patterns of behavior and you can recognize red flags. And his argument was if he were really a dictator, he wouldn't be out of office right now. If he were really a dictator, he would still be in office. That's this young man's argument. And it's the argument of probably millions who still support him. So let's talk about history. Okay. There are many examples I could draw from in history about how totalitarian or authoritarian regimes are built. I mean, we yes, we have Hitler, and everybody talks about Hitler. We have Mussolini, Tito. There's a many, many in history. I'm going to talk about the rise of Stalinist Russia, because that's what I know, because that's what I studied. It's what it still fascinates me to this day, Russian history. So I'm going to talk about how Stalin came to power. And I think you'll find it fascinating to hear, it's going to be a brief history, uh, because it's a very long, complicated, I think maybe that's part of the reason I've been so um, intrigued with Russian history. It's just complicated and complex, and there's a lot going on. But So I'm going to make it very brief history of Stalinist Russia. And in case you don't know, Stalin took power as a totalitarian, authoritarian dictator, right? He took control in Russia. And under him, really, really bad things happened. He murdered millions and millions of Russian people, okay? Millions under, uh, for the sake of what he called the, you know, kind of the greater good, right? A Marxist, he was a revolutionary Marxist. And we're going to talk more about that in a minute. But let's go back to 1903, okay? Because it's really important to understand the foundation under which uh, this, he, he came to power. So in 1903, there was, Russia was still living under a Tsar, right? It was an authoritarian, a Tsar, a king, a ruler who ruled the whole land, kind of like a king. And Vladimir Lenin, who was the predecessor to Stalin, was the leader of the Democratic Labor Party. One of the leaders. There were two really big leaders in the Democratic Labor Party representing the workers. So this is the Labor Party. They represented the workers under the Tsar. I think it was Nicholas. I should have looked that up. The Democratic Labor Party representing the workers uh, and the people of Russia opposing the, the Tsar's authority and all the bad working conditions of the labor of the, of the every day, the masses in Russia. During the Second Congress of the Democratic Labor Party, both Lenin and the other leader, Julius Martov, were disagreeing about the direction of the party. And they were at odds. They both had supporters and they were butting heads during this congressional meeting. They were butting heads. So they decided at once all the debate was over, this is how con congressional meetings usually go. One, they debate, they argue their causes, and then it goes to a vote. So when it went to a vote, Lenin lost. They voted in favor of the Martov direction that they wanted the party to go. But Lenin wasn't going to accept that. He's like, yeah, uh-uh, no, okay, I don't care, we lost. So he broke off and created his own party. So he created a party called the Bolsheviks. The Bolshevik party was born when Lenin lost the vote within his own party. And he branched off and said, yeah, sound familiar? Kind of see, this is why we, history matters. Here's a fun fact. So Lenin, who was the minority, right, they, the whole the whole Democratic Labor Party voted. Lenin's faction lost, but he broke off and created a party called the Bolshevik Party. And Martov's party became known as the Menshevik Party. Here's a fun fact. You know what Bolshevik, you know the root of that word in Russian? Bolshoi. The root of that word is Bolshoi, which means greater, more, big, right? And the Menshevik party, led by Martov, which was the leading party in the vote, the root of that word is, if I remember how to, how to pronounce my Russian alphabet correctly, is men, menshistva, menshistva. The root of the Menshevik party is menshistva, which still means the minority. <laughs> This is why words matter. And we have Trump now coming out. So we've been calling his lie 
about lose about winning the election the big lie he came out yesterday and said from now on this election is going to be known as the big lie the big lie because they stole the election from me words matter it can be twisted and morphed and when lenin decided he was going to name his minority party bolshevik which means majority <laughs> it it changes people's perceptions he became forever known as the Bolshevik Party, which means more, which means majority, when it wasn't. <laughs> mm -hmm. So if you think about it, isn't this kind of what the Republicans are doing? They're creating a different party. So they're branching off. They're creating not, it, it, they're no longer really the Republican Party. They're the Trumpovic. <laughs> I'm going to call them the Trumpovics. They are the Trumpovic Party. Although they are the majority, they they definitely have done. He did a great job of propagandizing and convincing supporters. So his supporters are the majority of the Republican Party. So that's the only difference between what Lenin did and what what the former guy did, except that they did branch. They're basically branching off, and he threatened to branch off. And I think that's why so many Republicans are still behind him, because if he breaks away from the Republican Party, he's going to take a lot of supporters with him. Fast forward to 1917, the, fresh, the Russian Revolution happens, the workers rise up against the Tsars, they go to the streets, they go on strike, the Tsar responds with violence to try to squash the workers who are striking in the streets and protesting. The Tsar responded with force. He sent his, his uh, armies out to squash them. And this literally went on for like a couple of years. There were continuous battles in the street where the workers were going on strike and it just created chaos among the Russian people between and more tension as they became more and more divided. More tension against the powerful elite and the workers, the those in power having the armies to try to crush down and squash the workers who were protesting and striking and trying to force them back to work. And it just created chaos until Germany declared war against them. Around the beginnings of, the, of World War I, Germany declared war on Russia and a wave of patriotism swept across the land in Russia as all of the workers forgot about their grievances against the Tsar, took up arms, joined armies to go fight the Germans. And then all that fell apart because they discovered that the, Germ that the Russian war minister was colluding with the Germans. He was helping the Germans in their efforts to take over Russia. And the workers were going to the front line, fighting the Germans literally with their bare hands. They were starving. They didn't have clothes. They didn't have firearms. They didn't have weapons to fight. And so that created, again, more chaos. So this wave of patriotism was, uh, again, erased by the disparity in the society of the Russian people. Once again, the workers were left to with the brunt of all of the work and forced to go to war to, and, and the Bolsheviks use this once again, here we are, you know, here we are, the workers, the average working man fighting for the elite, fighting for capitalism, fighting for a system that doesn't care about you. And so the Lenin and the Bolsheviks were able to use that to create further divide further chaos, further turmoil within society. And the 1917, so a lot happened in this 1917 time period. There was a, a civil war, there was the revolution. Basically, what happened is it led the Bolsheviks to seize power through armed revolution in 1917. So basically, through all of this turmoil and chaos of, of the World War I and being invaded by German and all the, all the chaos that was created during that time allowed an opening for an armed revolution. And this is what Lenin always wanted. And if you don't remember my video about socialism, the two different... Uh, parts of uh, the two different theories of socialism one is violent revolution and that's the one that Lenin believed in check out the video up here for the rest of that Lenin believed that the only way to implement socialism was through violent revolution and he used the chaos of the heels of the Civil War the heels of being 
invaded by Germany and all the chaos from the German war minister being a traitor, he used that to seize power. And once the Bolsheviks seized power under Lenin, they started to transform society. His whole idea was massive, widespread transformation of society for the people. It's all for the working people. It's all for you. We care about you, the working people. Against capitalism. Capitalism is, is the evil, is the enemy here. And so they started a whole program to take away private property and pitting really the low-level people there were different layers of farmers at the bottom and they started really pitting them against one another and just you know creating more chaos and turmoil so lenin implemented his plan to create a leninist marxist society within russia and you know he was he was working toward that up until 1924 when he died and when lenin died in 1924 so stalin had been there throughout this he had ingratiated himself he'd become more visible to Lenin and more helpful to Lenin and so he became a party leader throughout Lenin's regime and when Lenin died in 1924 he outmaneuvered all of the other people within the party to take control he outmaneuvered all the other people in the party so that by the early 1920s he had taken control complete control of the Communist Party. He also, they also changed the name of the uh, Bolshevik Party to the Communist Party. And by the late 1920s, he had stripped away all the safeguards and anything that was in place to make it more of a socialist, you know, group effort. By the mid, uh, by the late 1920s, he'd, he'd completely gotten away just just de decimated anything that was in his way to become a dictator and by the late 1920s he had become a dictator of the soviet union of the communist party and what he did once he gained power was again under the guise of implementing socialism for the people is he started these five-year plans which were going to collectivize agriculture and industrialize the Soviet Union and make them the the utopia socialist nation on the planet and to him the ends justified the means in the process of helping the people of Russia he would go in his people would go in to create collectives of the agricultural uh, the farmers basically any farmers who dissented were shot or sent off to gulags, which were labor camps. So once a dictator gets into power, the ends justify the means. They have a mission, they all they want, they have they have something they want to achieve, and to them, anybody who dissents is just in the way of that so-called greater good, whether they continue to believe that or not, or it's just what they sell to people. So Stalin continued to rule under what they, what we call a reign of terror shooting anybody who disagreed with him or who didn't toe the line, expanding the secret police, encouraging citizens to spy and tell on one another, and then, you know, the people who weren't towing the line, who weren't doing what they were supposed to do, got sent off to labor camps. Some of them, and I, I remember uh, my first video about buying land, and I talked about how I was concerned about dissenters under a, another term of the former president, I was I, I joked about, you know, I don't want to be one of those people because I don't agree with this who gets sent on a train to the countryside never to be seen again. That comes from Stalinist Russia. That's what they did. They sent dissenters, people who weren't willing to go along or who questioned the party line, were sent on trains to Siberia or to gulags, many times never seen or heard from again those trains where they really go so the secret police were started encouraging we've heard about this in Nazi Germany I don't know that we hear about it so much from the Stalinist Russia but it was the same expanding secret police encouraging people to tell on one another and in 1930s Stalin implemented what is called the Great Purge the Great Purge in 1930 he finally decided once and for all we need to get rid of all of the people who are standing in the way of our progress and they murdered and shipped 
anyone in the party, in the police, or in society, anyone who was considered a threat was either murdered or put on a train to Siberia or a gulag. Part of the reason he got away with this is because he had built a cult of personality around himself. People believed him. He, he controlled the Soviet media. He rewrote history books to give himself a more prominent role in the Russian Revolution. He named cities after himself, plastered his name on cities. Sound familiar? Right now it's only buildings, towers in New York, Manhattan. Imagine if he had gotten power again. Didn't he want to rename a bunch of stuff after himself anyway, the former president? That's all a part of molding and manipulating a psyche of a society by creating a cult of personality. When you create a cult, a cult of personality, the people who are bought into that cult or brainwashed by that cult, they'll let you get away with anything. They will literally let you get away with murder. I can shoot any, somebody on Fifth Avenue and get away with it. Stalin murdered millions of people and got away with it. Partly under, he had everything under his control through the cult of personality. People believed him. No matter how many lies he spewed, no matter how many history books he rewrote, he censored photographs. He censored books. He censored art. Imagine back then if he had the internet, right? One of the tools of the modern day, it's a lot harder to take control because we do have democratic institutions in place so far. It's a lot harder to take control of like MSNBC. So what do you do? You discredit them. Step one, that's step one. You discredit them so that your people only believe you and only believe the news news. I'm gonna start calling it. So I, I, I started something on Twitter yesterday. We all call Fox News faux, F-A-U-X news. I'm now calling it F-A-U-X-N-U-N-E-W-Z. Because <laughs> I think that's more appropriate. It's not news. But that's how you do it, right? That's how you take control of a society. Under the democratic institutions, he didn't have enough time. Four years. He didn't, he's, he's still trying. He didn't have enough time to co totally take control of anything. But... As you can see here in a minute, given more time, you can start stripping away and chipping away at our Constitution. He already started doing that. Stalin expanded the secret police. Former guy took over the Justice Department. William Barr is, might be in a buttload of trouble right now. These, it, it takes steps. And this is what I'm trying to show by, by giving you the history of Russia and how Stalin came to power. So Stalin, not only through this cult of personality, he, he changed the name of the city of Tsaritsyn. It was called Tsaritsyn for the Tsar. He renamed that to Stalin. So he was renaming cities. He even added his name to the national anthem. Stalin added his name to the national anthem. So it's not about the Communist Party anymore. It's about the person. It's about Stalin. It's about Stalin being able to do no wrong. Sound familiar? So Stalin continued his reign of terror until he died in 1953, but the effects lasted for decades after that. And he was able to get away with literally purging the party, the government, the police of anybody who disagreed with him by getting rid of them. And he was able to do this in the name of, I'm your guy. I'm, I'm the people's guy, even though he was killing the people. This is the power of a cult of personality. It literally is a cult. So why, do, why does this matter? Why am I telling you the history of Russia a hundred years ago? Why, what, it might seem drastic, right? Oh, you know, you're blowing things out of proportion, but I believe history matters. I believe if we don't understand history, we're destined to repeat it. We're human beings, right? We're creatures of habit. We're creatures of our own greed, our own motives, etc. And in many cases, authoritarians, dictators come to power by weaponizing fear. 
And I'm sure Stalin did that. And we're seeing that now. We are creatures of habit. And we're, we're simple, really, in many ways, right? I mean, if, if the people in power, if the wannabe dictators and those around them who are helping them understand history, they understand how to put these people in power. So don't you think it matters that we understand history so that we recognize the flags? We recognize the signs of that? Because you know the smart people, the educated people in power, you know they know history. You know that they're banking on you not knowing history and are going to let them get away with this. And that's exactly what the Republican Party's doing. They think their audience is stupid. They're banking on them not seeing the signs. They're banking on them not having enough self-awareness to understand that they're being manipulated. Just like Stalin did in Soviet Russia a hundred years ago. I can't say it enough. The people who are trying to control you know history. They know what works. And they're counting on you not. Another reason I bring this up is because the argument is that if the former president were really a dictator, he wouldn't be out of office. He'd still be in office. And I've used the example of Hitler for a long time. Hitler's first attempt at seizing control failed. And in fact, he was put in prison. So the first coup attempt by Hitler failed, and he was put in prison where he wrote Mein Kampf, which is my struggle in English, and that gained him more of a following of a cult of personality. So that by the time he got out of prison, his, his support had grown drastically and created a playground, for lack of a better word, but created an atmosphere for him to be able to seize control. He learned from what he did wrong the first time. Yeah. Same with Stalin. Stalin didn't just wake up in 1903 and try to seize power. He didn't like try to kill Stalin or try to get rise in the in the party overnight. No, he sat back. He bided his time. He waited. This is what smart, cunning, criminal sociopaths do, <laughs> right? If he had tried to overthrow the government in 1903, he may never have come to power in 1923, I think it was, when, when Lenin died. He would have been ousted. He would have been exiled. Same with former guy. He tried. Boy, did he try. He tried every tool in the tool book. Luckily, our democracy and our constitution hung on by a thread. But that doesn't mean it's over. We are seeing a wannabe dictator who is building his cult of personality. Hitler was in prison, wrote a book. Did you hear the former guy just started a blog? He is not letting go because he knows. Because the people around him, I don't believe he studied history, but I believe the people around him and the people who control him, I still think he's controlled by Putin. Putin knows history. <laughs> right? Right? Putin is Russian. Putin knows Russian history. Putin knows how Stalin came to power. Don't you think? It sounds an awful lot like what's going on here, doesn't it? Create a cult of personality so that people will believe you no matter what. They'll let you get away with murder because they will believe that you really care about them, just like Stalin did. Stalin had his people convinced, I really care about you. So the fact that I'm killing your neighbors, I'm doing it for you right? Don't you believe me? I'm doing it for you. They were bad. They were against you. They were your enemy, pitting friends and neighbors and family against one another. And his supporters said, okay, you're my man. I believe you. That's what we're seeing now. And that's why it's so important to understand the historical context of dictators and totalitarian regimes with what we have going on today and trying to remove Liz Cheney from power. It is not about policy. It's about nothing other than she's not supporting the cult of personality. She's a dissenter. And to think that the next step isn't something more lethal or something more permanent, if they had power, you're kidding yourselves. 
You're kidding yourselves. I don't think Stalin started off murdering people. Lenin, you know, Lenin was almost as bad, but not quite as bad. He didn't have the numbers of murders and things. But Lenin was also suppressing people's dissent. And when Lenin was suppressing people's dissent in maybe more subtle ways, removing them from power if they didn't agree, so silencing them because he controlled the media, so they had a, they didn't have a platform, they didn't have a voice. Where were they going to uh, speak their dissent if they didn't have a platform and if they were no longer in power? St then Stalin comes along and he's like, yeah, that's not enough. They can still be powerful. They can still be organizing in churches and cafes. That's not enough. We need to get rid of them. You know, when I was preparing this video, the one thing that kept crossing my mind was slippery slope. This is a slippery slope if we ever saw a slippery slope. This is a slippery slope with water and Vaseline and oil and every slippery substance you can imagine. We are this close to, to s s sliding off the edge into something that none of us wants. And I'm amazed that the very people who think this is okay, that censuring Liz Cheney, stripping her of her leadership and her power within the party simply for telling the truth don't see that slippery slope but heaven forbid you should wear a mask oh my god that's a slippery slope into taking away your rights when we take away the right of someone to tell the truth and that's what they're doing they're punishing her they're setting an example not only is it saying, yeah, that's not cool, it's taking, uh, it's threatening. It's taking away her career. It's threatening her career. It's threatening her livelihood. It's warning other people that if you speak out, this is what's going to happen to you. Same fear task tactics used in Stalinist Russia by the secret police. Don't speak out. Your neighbor might tell on you and you'll lose your life or you'll lose your house or you'll lose your land. What the Republicans are doing right now with Liz Cheney is saying, don't speak out. Don't, don't you dare speak the truth. You will pay. And one more thing before I close, the Republicans want us to fear socialism. Oh, those socialist radical Democrats and those socialist libs, and they want to take all your rights away. They want to, don't wear your mask. They just want to strip you of your rights. While at the same time implementing the tools, using the tools, the strategies, the fear tactics, the cult of personality, using all the same tools that socialist communist Stalin used to control his people. So... You have to fear socialism, but don't look over here while we're using all the same tools the fascist socialists used to control their people. I don't know. I've been struggling with making videos uh, on this channel because we're not out of the hot water yet. These people are still powerful, and I'm afraid they're getting more and more powerful behind the scenes. And, um, it's a scary time. It's a scary time when people are punished for telling the truth. All right. What do you think? What are your thoughts on this? I hope you found this interesting and fascinating. Maybe learned a thing or two. Maybe also give you some tools when you're speaking to your, uh, Republican friends and family, maybe help them see and again, I think the biggest argument right now is, is really, if, if you don't understand history, the people who are trying to control you do. Yeah. All right. I'll see you next time. Thanks so much for being here. Good luck. Speak truth to power whenever you can. Bye.